In this video, we're going to talk about Progenity trading under the ticker symbol PROG. We're going to cover the price action over the past few days, the company itself, and the recommendations regarding buying, holding, or selling the shares. If you would like to see more stock analysis videos, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. But before today's video begins, I'd just like to clarify a few things about the timing when my videos are recorded, uploaded, and how much they react to the latest market updates. So most of my videos are recorded and scheduled the day before and uploaded for the next day. For five days out of seven, it's a trading day. So of course, by the time the video goes live on my channel, the price would have already evolved from there. If there are significant and very volatile movements during the trading day, obviously they will not appear in the video on that day. But usually, to the extent possible, my analysis will be based on the medium term and not really focused on the intraday movements. The reason why it shouldn't matter that much either way is because most people investing in stocks invest for some kind of reason that takes time to get developed and that their positions are usually kept for at least a few weeks. With that being said, if there are significant stock price movements that happen afterwards, either they will not affect the overall picture or if they're significant enough, they will be mentioned in the next video about the stock with re-evaluations of the circumstances as needed. Progenity is a small cap company operating in the sector of biotech, and it develops products like molecular testing. Looking at its operations, I think that what it does is similar to what Bionanogenomics does. They may take a while before they have an actual operational cash flow going in, and in the meantime, they may have to dilute shareholders to keep the ship afloat. We have seen this kind of scenario with quite a few other startup companies. This means that, at least in the short term, the fundamentals are going to be where they are, meaning not that rosy. But I think that the main reason why Progenity is trending in conversations online right now is because the company is currently part of a short squeeze between those who want to push the price down and those who want to squeeze out the short sellers. It's one of the more volatile stocks, definitely so far in 2021 and hereby provides a lot of opportunities to profit from its up and downs in addition to the potential gains from the short squeeze itself the market cap of progenity is currently at 452.6 million dollars and the enterprise value is at 331.3 million dollars the market cap is the price tag the financial market is willing to evaluate progenity stock at, which, considering its future potentials as well as the short-term fundamentals and events, the enterprise value of the company is the net result of the company's assets values if there is no debt. Usually the market cap is higher than the EV, but sometimes there are exceptions, such as in the situations of highly leveraged companies or companies that are under the pressure from short sellers, which is the case of Progenity. The quick ratio of the company is 1.34, same for current ratio, and the debt over equity is minus 1.14. In other words, there is very little debt or no debt of Progenity, and the company is very liquid. So I don't think that just in order to keep the ship afloat, they're going to dilute the shareholders, which is a good thing for us. The average trading volume of Progenity has been around 52.8 million shares, and the daily volumes have been hovering between 19 to 73 million shares. The one-year beta of Progenity is currently at minus 0.35. Its 52-week high is $7.86 and the 52-week low is $0.67. Cents. So the one-year beta is usually like a measurement of how volatile the market is and how volatile your stock is compared to the market. So Progenity, even though it has a minus 0 0.35, this is just because the stock has been trading for not that long. And 
in the grand scheme of things, I think that it's actually a very volatile stock, all things considered. Now, let's talk about the options market for Progenity. In terms of volume and open interest, the options market seem to favor the calls, but with significant interest in put options as well. Generally speaking, the put means that the market expects a downward tendency and the calls mean that the market expects an upward tendency. The key strike prices where there seems to be the most interest are $3, $3.50 and $4. Looking at the stock, it's quite obvious that the momentum has been picking up recently ever since the stock touched a bottom in late September of 2021. The price went from below $1 to $3.52 in a matter of weeks, which is very impressive for a stock that is still under the pressure from short sellers. The most important question retail traders should consider is whether their portfolio can live with a stock of that kind of risk profile, because the overall trend has been a downward one if we look at the overall picture. But if you believe that your portfolio is sufficiently solid and diversified, I would say that it would be a good thing to keep around 1% of your portfolio in progenity in case the stock goes up. In the meantime, in the meantime, I would recommend to buy around 25 of your allocation now and to keep the rest over the next couple of weeks to see if it pulls back. If it doesn't, then buy the rest of your allocation then. But try to see if you can snipe for some lower cost basis. In this current market environment, I believe that we should be careful about taking positions and risk in the financial market in general, and in the equity market in particular. Because over the past decade or so, the financial market has been living with the help of newly created capital from QEs, resulting in a massive increase of asset prices and the corresponding decrease in their yields. And the low interest rate also contributed to reinforce this phenomenon because the financial sector would see its profit margins reduced and in turn keeps the returns of other sectors and employees low as well. At the same time, the market doesn't represent the real economy and the real economy doesn't get reflected in the price of different securities. The market is a game of supply and demand which will depend on a number of factors, not just the fundamentals. If the asset prices only depend on the fundamentals, then their performances in the Northern Hemisphere would have been more than mediocre, because things have been mostly stagnant over the years. A few things can explain why asset prices managed to remain high despite the stagnation of the underlying businesses. The first one is that over the years, there has been more money printed by different central banks to support their own economies. But because that money is distributed to banks and expected to loan to businesses to create more jobs, and that in fact there aren't that many opportunities out there, this money became capital that travels around the world and went into the huge financial melting pot. The QEs are now wrapping up in many countries, so I don't think that it'll remain as the main driving force over the next couple of years to keep the asset prices up. But it's compensated by the arrival of new capital from different regions to North America because it's perceived as a safe haven for investors. With the rising tensions around the world, this capital inflow will probably be sustained over the next couple of years, if not intensifying. The last phenomenon is the creation of artificial bubbles that are either supported by real market trends or completely fictional ones to allow market participants to play the game of hot potato and to either create profits or to safe keep their capital. The EV sector back in 2020 is an excellent example of this. But nevertheless, what it means for the market is that the degree of uncertainty is probably going to increase over the foreseeable future, as the expectation for a recession has been building up for more than a decade. 
and that the economic difficulties are accumulating around the world, especially from Asia. What this means for the market and for us is that the volatility is supposed to increase over time, which will provide opportunities to make a profit or to incur losses, depending on the timing and risk manager. Another thing to note for this period of time is that we have to be very careful about having shorts. It's already riskier than having longs because the losses of shorts are not limited, right? Because there's no limit in terms of how far the stock can increase. But with the increased involvement of short sellers, I believe that the stocks been shorted will have an even higher probability of getting squeezed, which will result in potentially massive losses. So we're also like observing more of an irrational behavior from market participants in the sense that very often people will choose to rush in a position, not necessarily because the fundamentals are convincing, but because there's a buildup of demand in a specific stock and people will pile in to ride the gravy train with the rest of us. That kind of behavior is highly risky and may result in losses. It's worth pointing out that in 2020 and probably in 2021, the market has never presented that many opportunities, but it was also during that same period of time that many retail traders have incurred their biggest losses. A rule of thumb is that each position should be structured so that even if they don't succeed, they don't impact the portfolio stability. Positions should begin small so that there is an opportunity to average down later. And specifically for the growth stocks, I think that 5 to 10% overall should be a healthy weight for the portfolio. And each stock should represent about 1 to like 3% of the positions. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.